through your eyes. And so uh, I am very grateful for what you are doing for so long. We have not really documented our story and Jangunu is indeed our story. And so let me start at the beginning for me, which was that I grew up in the Bahamas, Delancey Town, on the hilltop. Um, I never understood, I never knew that I had a culture per se. And I did not have that awakening until I went off to Canada to school. And suddenly I realized I had an accent. Suddenly I realized that not everybody ate cow salad. And certainly nobody was getting up in the middle of the night at Christmas time to shut down the main street and put on a costume made out of paper and cardboard and dance to some weird music from some drums and bells. And I asked my mother what kind of crazy people we come from. And she couldn't tell me. And that is what really started me um, researching um, how we got to be, as I say, who we is as Bahamians. And in a nutshell, I, I found out what I put together was that what we call the culture of the Bahamas is a combination of the traditions and, and culture um, of people who came to live here, specifically the British, because we were a British colony for over 300 years, and the Africans who were brought here by force. And so I started to dig down deep into what, uh, what caused me as a child to be mesmerized by the beat of a drum and by the tinkle of a cowbell. I grew up in West Street and every Junkano morning, my uncle, Ivern, he would be sitting to the kitchen table, fully clothed. He had on his whole suit except for the jacket. And up the road would come Sax Taylor and his Junkano group. And they would stop it in front of our house. And while the men heated the drums across the street, my uncle would get up, put on his coat, and they would escort him with great pomp and respect to Bay Street to the parade. And when the parade was over, they would bring him back. And I didn't understand this compulsion that started to grow in me for this thing called Jankanoo. The result was at the age of four, I asked if I could rush. And in those days, this would have been 1954, it was not something that good people did, especially if you were a female. But because I was four and my uncle was on the committee, they thought it was cute. And so they bought a hold of Spurgeon Smith, who was who had a Junkanoo group that came from what is today called, they, mommy called it uh, um, out east um, by in the pond area. And they got a hold of Spurgeon and they had a little, a little cloth uh, um, pants and shirt made for me. And he would come and get it at the beginning of December and take it and have it pasted and bring it back. And so every Junkanoo morning, they walked me out to Bay Street and our meeting place was in front of Fines Department Store. You all do young. You all don't know nothing about what, what I'm talking about. Where is that now? Where is that department store now? Fines Department Store is right next. Um, if you come past Frederick Street, it's before you get to the, um, Lord, I almost said the Nassau Shop, before you get to John Bull. Well, okay. And, yeah. I know. I and, 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 and A. Baker is on the corner. Fines department store was right there, just a little bit beyond Frederick Street. And they would stand there with me. And when Spurgeon came down the street, they would hand me over and off I would go. And this happened every year. And when I passed for St. John's College, mommy said, now that's not something that young ladies do. And they made me stop while I was in high school. And when I went off to college and came back by then thing, Things were changing, and uh, you know the attitude was, "Oh, these crazy college kids—they'll do anything." And so back on the street I went, but I could not understand this compulsion to the hold that Jankunu had on me. I could not understand that, 
And that, like I say, especially when I went off to Canada and came back and realized it was such a strange tradition um, that we, that, that only us seemed to do. And that's what led to my voyage of discovery. And what I discovered was that, as I told you, the Africans really were the only group that were brought here by force. Everybody else had a choice to come. Columbus came to our part of the world, went back, spread the news about all the wealth. The other European nations came out here. They enslaved initially the original Americans. And when they died out, they decided to go to Africa to replace the labor force for many reasons. Africa was close to Europe. Africa, um, the Africans were very skilled in animal husbandry, in, in farming, in metalworking. Uh, they were acclimatized to hot weather and uh, slavery existed in Africa already. As we know from the Bible, slavery is as old as man. And so this was not unique. So the Europeans decided to come to Africa. If you were in Africa at that time, you could, be, you could become a slave basically in two ways. If my culture, my tribe, my people went to war against yours, then if you captured me, I became your slave. If, 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 if there was a drought in my part of the world, I could grab up the Jaron, grab the Georgie bundle, and we could sell, I could, we could go to another part of the country where people were eating and we could sell ourselves. <clears throat> so it was an economic institution. The slavery that the Europeans introduced was very different. It was chattel slavery. The Europeans invented, they dreamt up a concept called racism. And in a nutshell, what racism says is that the level of your intelligence is commensurate with the color of your skin. Wow. And so whereas the Bible put us on one line, we're all created equal in the sight of God, the concept of slavery, this is how I think about it, the concept of racism turns that line up like a totem pole. And, and what it says is, and it links it to the color of your skin. So the whiter your skin, the sharper your features and the straighter your hair, the higher you go up on the totem pole and the more intelligent you are. And conversely, the blacker your skin, the broader your features, the pickier your hair, the less intelligent you are and the lower you go on the totem pole to the point where chattel slavery did not consider human beings of ebony complexion to be human at all. And so slavery went from, 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 from being an economic institution to being one, this particular type of slavery based on, on color dictated by class. And so they based to some extent, there's so much to be read still, they based to some extent this whole ridiculous concept. They justified it by going to the Bible. Wow. And in, in Genesis chapter nine, we read that Noah, we always had a story with the ark, but he was the first farmer. And he grew these grapes. He made this wine and he got drunk. And he fell asleep in his tent naked. His youngest son, Ham, came in, saw his daddy naked, went out and told the other two boys. And he obviously must have thought it was a big joke. They were horrified. They backed back into the, 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 the tent with his cloak. They were holding his cloak behind their head, we are told. They backed back into the room and they threw the cloak over him so that they could not see his nakedness. And when he awoke and he found out what, they, what, what Ham had done, he said, cursed be Canaan, Ham's son. Your children shall be slaves. You shall be 
be called a slave to your brothers. That's why black people very often are referred to as the children of Ham. And the Bible tells us that, that, that the descendants of Ham moved south into Africa. So this was one justification for the concept of racism. And so armed with all of this, the Europeans decided to come to Europe, to Africa, sorry, to enslave Africans. And so this was the beginning of the triangular trade. They would come from England, they would come with guns, they would come with mirrors, trinkets, all kinds of things. And they would sail along the African coast and they would trade these things for humans. Now, initially, the, uh, they, they were able, and we always we get bits and pieces of the story, and we are always told, you know, well, you all sold each other into slavery, and that is true. But I read a comment Olada Equiano uh, made when he wrote his memoirs. He said, the worst slave where he came from in West Africa, he would prefer to be the worst slave in West Africa than what he encountered from the Europeans when he came to this part of the world. So anyhow, to get back to the story. So they would come to you to Africa and they would trade, they would trade for slaves. And as the demand grew and grew and grew, they had to go further and further inland. And so people, Africans started to assist them by kidnapping. Uh, other Africans to be able to sell. The same child I just told you about, Olada Equiano. He was 11 years old when he was captured. He was from the Igbo tribe. He said their parents had gone hunting. He was in the yard playing with his dear sister, he called her. And suddenly two men jumped over the fence, threw a net over his head. And in my words, that's when the voyage into nowhere the voyage, into, the voyage of horror began. They were marching for several days. And they were sold and resold several times. He arrived to the coast. It is an 11-year-old child who has been separated from his family. He's chained with other slaves in a group called a slave coffle. And they are marched to the coast. We don't have the time, and in, no matter how difficult the COVID-19 circumstances in which we find ourselves, we cannot imagine the unspeakable horror of this circumstance, and it was about to get worse. Yeah. They get to the coast. Many Africans were terrified who had never seen the ocean before. They get to the coast and they throw them into a dungeon to wait until the ship arrives. This year, uh, um, Ghana has called this year the year of the return. And many people of African descent, including Bahamians, have gone back to Ghana. And they have seen these forts on the West African coast where the slaves were held before they were put on the ships. And the door through which they went uh, to get onto the ship is how was always called the door of no return. Once you went through there, that was it for you. So they loaded them onto the boats. Very often, as in Olada's case, very often if you were the first, among the first that they captured, they would make several stops down the West African coast before they head out across the Atlantic. And so you could be on this ship before you got here, as long as some people, some, some estimates go as high as two to three months. And so you are down in the hold of the ship. They were configured in many different ways. Some of them had, um, like the Henrietta Marie, some of them had shells that came out from the side of the ship, um, five feet into the, into the hold of the ship on each side, 18 inches apart, and you had a width of 15 inches to get your body in there. And so one man's right ankle would be chained to one man's left. In some cases, they were pushed in um, 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 as pairs. 
it was an absolutely horrifying experience. You imagine 300 people who are jammed down in the bottom of this ship. The diet is different from what you are accustomed to. So you are, your stomach doesn't give up on you. You are vomiting, you have diarrhea, there's nowhere to run. It had to be hell on earth. It had to be. Wow. Once, and I, I, I haven't even mentioned the, the point that many of them were branded before they got on the ship to show who the owner was. If you refuse to eat, they whip you. Punishment was severe. Flogging was, 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 was just a natural part of your existence now. What, there were sharks that followed those ships straight across the Atlantic. There were so many. This is the part of the story we very often don't hear. The Africans were rebelling from the first chain was put on them. There were mothers that smothered babies rather than let them grow up as slaves. There were so many Africans who jumped overboard and those who tried to jump overboard to re who refused to accept this new condition. In many cases, once a day, you are brought on the deck of the ship to exercise because you are an animal, but you got to be a live animal because they got to sell you. And so once a day, you are brought on the deck to exercise. And in many cases, the only physical item that you are allowed to bring out of your motherland with you is a goat skin drum. And the purpose of the drum was to keep the beat while you exercised. And I believe that the power of that drum was more sustaining than the Europeans realized. It was a nightmare. This child thought that these white men were going to eat him. He had never seen anybody looking like that before. And what made it worse was that because they were all from different cultures, he could not understand a lot of what the other enslaved was saying. To be ripped from your homeland like that, this is why you want to cry. I, 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 I try to keep to the story. This is why you want to cry today when you see young Bahamian men chucking up one another and shooting one another when they do not understand the price that was paid for them to be here. One month, two months, three months. Finally, the ship pulls up right behind the Pompeii Museum of emancipation and slavery. That was Vendu House. They take you off. They wash you down. You got a little you each or whatever. So there you are standing there, humiliated, degraded. You are an animal. You do not own yourself. You do not own anything belonging to you. You don't own your personality. You don't own your inner feelings. You don't own anything. The auction starts. They start to bid on you. Well, that, that's after people come around before the auction to make sure that you are a good sale. So they check in your deed and they check in under your arm on your private parts and they're checking you to make sure you don't have any sores or any disease that would mean that they would waste their money if they bought you a thing.
if Henry Moss, oh Lord, you didn't want to own, belong to Henry Moss, they were cruel. If Henry Moss bought you, he took you down to Crooked Island. If Lord Roll bought you, you were on one of the plantations in the Exumas and on and on like that. Mr. If Mr. Farquharson bought you, you went to San Salvador. And as you can see, this is where we get our names from. So, okay. Now you here, away from your country. I don't care how beautiful the Bahamas is. This wasn't your country. It was just a numbing experience. The first, it could, it could vary, let's say approximately the first two to three months was very often, I'm generalizing here, very often called the seasoning period. The purpose of the seasoning period was to convince you that you were an animal. That's the long and short of it. To get you accustomed to life on the plantation, to the climate and all of that, I guess, and bad treatment, but to convince you that you were an animal. That was the first thing. So everything to do with your heritage is suddenly wrong. You're too black. You're too, your head too picky. Your nose too broad. When you see your reflection anywhere, you just ain't right. And so they teach you to hate yourself. They change your name, strip you of your identity, discourage any indication of what you left behind. And so here you are. And sadly, I shouldn't say sadly, I, this is not passing judgment, but right up to 2020, you will find on the world market that skin bleach and hair color, and sorry, and hair, are uh, huge commodities and we continue to insult each other based on how we look and okay, you stop you... and you think back over your school wow before you go, go on a little further a lot of persons are complaining about the volume you could check your volume for me your mic volume yeah i i checked that just before i came on everything is up as high as it can be yeah, because everybody oh is telling me they can't hear yep. the sound. It's my, my right sound, up. My sound is um my sound is, is very high. Let me see. My sound is very high. My volume, my speaker, and my microphone are as high as they can go. Yeah. I don't know if it's just the internet or I don't know what to what I don't know what else to do. But mine, I, 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 I turn it might be the internet, I don't yeah. know. Well, we apologize for any it. technical difficulties. Can you hear me all right? I can hear you clearly, but a lot of persons on the outside are saying they can't really hear what you're saying. Papa, you can hear us? Papa? I can hear her fine. She's good for me. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can hear her, yes. I can hear her fine too, but I have a lot of persons online saying, that they can't yeah, hear the same yeah. sound, sound, sound. Mm. So I don't know if it's from the internet or, or what right. it is. I'm trying to reach me. Yeah, but it might be the internet because, okay. Because my, my settings are turned up as loudly as they can be. I don't know if it's the internet. My, um, I have my sound turned up to 95. And I, I can hear you perfect clearly. I can hear you clearly. I can hear you on paparazzi clearly. Yeah, I, I, I truly don't know what else to do. Well, we can finish on because I'm recording. So. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm getting a message now that the internet connection is unstable. Yeah, I got that too earlier. <clears throat> So you want me to continue? Yeah, we can continue. Okay. Yeah, so as I was saying, with the seasoning period, and so the self-hatred, and then the other aspect of the seasoning period is to make sure that we are not getting on so well together. 
And so, you know, I like to say, I shouldn't say I like to say, but I, in my mind, it would be in the Bahamas today called the black rab syndrome. We, 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 we are deliberately pitted against each other to make it very difficult for us to unite, to um, be a threat to, to the master. Mm -hmm. And so um, old against young, male against female, the blacker slaves against the fairer slaves. Uh, the fairer slaves are given easier jobs closer to the house. The blacker slaves have to rake the salt and pick the cotton and be out there in the hot sun. And uh, it's, 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 it's a situation just that just encourages division. And so you, you are in a very dangerous period in history. You, you, you cannot move from one plantation to the, you, you have no freedom of your own. Your decisions are not yours. They are your masters. You belong to him. When I tell the children this story, I tell them the same way you have a pet, the same way you have a kitten or a puppy, and they can't go outside unless you open the door. They won't eat unless you feed them. That is how human beings who were slaves were treated, and it is wrong. Yeah. It was it was one of the worst times to be alive. I can't, I just don't have the time to explain the psychological uh, impact of that experience of slavery on our ancestors. So here you are now in your new environment, whatever island you are on, and you can decide, as I tell the children, that you don't feel like working today or you must do what you are told to do, or you are severely punished. Your children can be sold, you can be sold, your ma could be sold. Nothing is respected because you are just not a human being. And then, <clears throat> this, is, this is the simple version of the story. Your master informs you, these are my words, there's a festival in his church that is called Christmas. And because it is so important to them, by law, by law, it is to be observed by three days holiday. And that goes for everybody including the hands who are enslaved. Sadly, we do not have an African voice that tells the story in the Bahamas. We have to intuit what we believe they felt. And I believe their thinking went like this. We are in a terrible situation. We have been defined here as animals. Yet we cannot be animals because when we were back home in the mother country, we celebrated every rite of passage in the human experience with a ceremony. When the baby was born, when we named the baby, when a girl became a woman or a boy became a man, when somebody died, we commemorate separation between the sacred and the secular in, 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 in African society. We cannot be animals because animals don't have festivals. And so we will use these three days at Christmas time to remind if only ourselves that we are members of the human family. And we will do that by recreating our festivals from home. There are many West African festivals. I didn't bring the documentation tonight. Many West African festivals that have components of what we today call Jankanu. Most of them, we are from different cultures, but most of our festivals we discover share four things in common. We all use a goat, we use a goat skin drum, most of us. 
We always use some kind of bell or rattle. You always decorate yourself fully for your festival and when you cover your face, it symbolizes the presence of the ancestors. And so in these isolated islands, what is your decoration? Leaves and feathers and shells and sponge and seaweed, feather, anything indigenous. And I tell the children, we'll never know for sure, but you know what I think happened? I think one day something floated out of the master's window and you looked around before you picked it up and you grab it up and you sneak it off. And when you got in the bush at Christmas time, you stuck it onto your clothes because you're not supposed to have it. It was a mark of defiance. And they say, say, what do you think was so important that you could be punished for having? And they tell me gold and silver and all kinds of things. I say, uh, uh it was simply paper wow. because by law, slaves, were not permitted to learn to read and write. And then I talked to them about the importance of their education. And now we need our music. We know how to make a drum. We need a bell. Well, we are on a farm and there goes that cow. We grab that bell from around his neck and we good to go. And 200 years ago in the dark, in the night, at Christmas time, they came me and say, man, <laughs> we survived. Let's celebrate life and the strength of the human spirit. And they build in research and celebration every single year. And down through the centuries, we came shaking our bells, beating a drum, sticking paper onto our clothes until we get to the magnificent festival that we today call Junkanoo. And I know for the fact when I say that we have reduced it to a parade and a competition. It is the spirit of the people of the Bahamas, a people who could celebrate in most in some of the most is known to man in slavery. They stole away to reclaim their heritage. And that is what we continue with today. And so it went on from there. In 1899, a law was passed because obviously the Junkanoo was indiscriminate up and down the streets, every street, <laughs> it sounded like, um, um, and in the town of Nassau. And in 1899, the government passed a law that restricted it to four times, to Christmas Eve, Christmas morning, New Year's Eve, and New Year's morning. The evening parades, were, the evening celebration were not um, well attended, and so it, it, it went to Christmas Day and it went to, uh, um, it went to New Year's Day. In 1938, the religious leaders complained about this raucous festival taking place on the Savior's birthday, and that is when Boxing Day was made a public holiday and the Christmas parade was moved to Boxing Day. And so, and so we have come up to the present day. We've the, right around 1900, the parade started, the, the Junkanoo started to move to Bay Street. In the 1920s, during the period of prohibition, when alcohol was forbidden in the United States, and uh, uh, many, many Americans started to come to, to, to Nassau, um, tourists, to be able to drink and celebrate and all of that. And the parades were encouraged um, as a tourist attraction. On the 22nd of March in 1922, the hotel burned down smack and smooth. The British colonial, which was wooden, not British colonial, it was the hotel colonial, burned down in 1922. And that was in March. And they decided that they had to have that hotel up for the new season for the end of the year. And the Bahamians flocked down there looking for work, only to discover that most of the jobs had been taken by Cubans that had been brought in here to work. And it caused a problem, made it known that they had a problem. And eventually they were eventually they were hired, but the government decided, for want of a better word, to punish them 
by not allowing Jean Canu, um Christmas of 1922. The hotel opened in February of 1923. Business was booming, everybody having a wonderful time, and this is a wonderful time to have John Canoe for the tourists. You know what the John Canoe said? No, you didn't let us have it last year. That's all right, we'll stay over the hill. And John Canoe was in Grantstown. The merchants on Bay Street complained because they didn't make any money, and people started to understand the economic value of the parade, and eventually John Canoe returned. When the when um, the riots occurred in 1942, the Burma Road riot, John Canoe again was banned. All street parading, including John Canoe. Again, the John Canoe celebration moved over the hill and continued there. The drums never stopped beating. In 1947, a group of Bahamians, black and white, male and female, got together, formed themselves into a group called the Citizens Masquerade Committee, and they petitioned the government to have John Canoe returned to Bay Street. The government said, in essence, these are my words, yes, you can have a New Year's Parade 1948, and if the people behave, that's my words, then you can continue. And so John Canoe from then till now has been on Bay Street from, night, from New Year's 1948, with maybe one exception, um, until now. And so my uncle Ivern was a member of that committee. And in gratitude to him for the part he played in John Canoe coming back to Bay Street, that is the reason why the John Canoes from down the hill would come up and get him every John Canoe morning. And I found all of this out after. But our story is a very proud one. And I think it is important that we understand it so that we can get beyond the competition and beyond the parade. When we get in the road other times, Labor Day, well, Independence is becoming almost like Christmas now. But whenever there's a spontaneous rush, even rush, you start to snip and the parade and the competition that forces us to reenact this magnificent ritual of celebration and pride every year. It speaks to the spirit of the people of the Bahamas. And so I have no doubt, as we have done in many other times in our history, that we will survive the present situation and the sound of our drums and the sounds of our bells will ring out the spirit of the people of the Bahamas. There you have it, folks, all in a nutshell. And every time Ms. Ali Nash Ferguson tells that story of the history of our ancestors, ancestors sorry, coming across those waters shackled together, not being able to breathe, this, you know, it's a serious thing. Papa, what do you think about that? Uh, I, I learned a lot tonight. Um, it's, it's a lot. There's a lot. Um, it's interesting, uh, you know, growing up, you know, um, going through high school and, and, and most of your formal education in the Bahamas, you don't get that African no. history. You get the European you, history. You get told I, somebody else's history. Absolutely. I, I, I actually was taught history by an Englishman from England. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, yes. So I, I never was I never was um, afforded the information I got tonight and trust me, wow. Is all I can say is wow. Yeah. Um I we, we when made, I did when I majored sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead, you go ahead. I was saying when I majored in history, I did American history, I did Russian history, British history was all we did at St. John's in the 1960s. I had to teach myself Bahamian history to, to, to be able to teach it in, in Nassau, but we don't tell it, as you say, we don't tell it from, a, from an Afrocentric point of view. When, when I do the history of the Bahamas and, and, and I say 
if you don't remember nothing else, remember that Columbus did not discover the Bahamas and everybody eyeball open because <laughs> it's, it's one thing that you begin to learn is that when you study history, you must take into account what is called historiography. Historiography is, as I said about Charmaine early, earlier at the beginning, you are seeing history through the eyes of the people who are writing it, and their perspective will not, off, will not be always yours. So as far as the Europeans were concerned, Columbus discovered the Bahamas because they didn't know this was here. But for us as intelligent, modern Bahamians, we cannot say that. I cannot walk into a restaurant and say, oh, I discovered this because it's my first time there. And I meet people there. You see what I'm saying? So yeah. you must filter everything through your eye. And that's why I use the word intuit. You must intuit. And I always remember something Nicolette Bethel said on Junkanoo 242. She said, we must reject any narrative that makes us look stupid. And so when you hear stories and there are many you know when you hear stories about about you know Junkanoo being named after a man because he was well, he was a, he was a slave owner slave holder and and whatever you know why would be why, why and and when you look at at the many african festivals that have similar names or similar practices then you start you have to start to think this out for yourself Junkanoo has been documented i always remember Remember Jackson saying, Junkanoo, we know, was documented in the Bahamas as early as 1801. Jackson's comment was, Jackson said, yeah, but that's when the white people find out. <laughs> and so, and so, and so we have to see everything from our vantage point, and very often that means completely giving it a completely different spin from what we, from what we, from what we have read. That is so true. And Alan, now that I, I, I relive that uh, whole story that you talked about again tonight, it makes me more, uh, you know, be more appreciative mm -hmm. of where we have come from. But we, we now have to try the young people, the persons that are coming up. Mm -hmm. That's why I really wanted you to come on and talk about that story because they're not understanding. We have a lot of persons mm -hmm. right now in Jumpano who mm -hmm. just come don't really know where Junkaloo comes from and think it's all about, like we were talking about on your show, the beads, the feathers, all of these things that are not irrelevant to where <clears throat> our ancestors suffered from to get us here and what the, the real traditional having that festival really means to us. And that's why too, um, yes. like you say, when we hear that drum, when we hear that whistle, we get a particular feeling, you get goosebumps. You know, yes. that you're inside, yes. like say, feel it in your belly. You get this feeling that comes over you that mm -hmm. is so different. It has to be something that is causing that. Yeah, and knowledge is power. You see, everybody on the parade now um, only know Junkanoo as a parade and as a competition. You see what I'm saying? They don't, they, they, that's, that's all they know. That's what they know as Junkanoo. And so it is those of us who know the story, we have a responsibility to make sure we get that deeper message across. That's why I named my book, I Come to Get Me. I cannot begin to tell you when I first heard that expression, you are in the shock. And these fellas walk in and say, man, I come to get me. Yeah. And I'm saying to myself, they do not know that 300 years ago, their ancestors went into the bush to get their spirit and to revive their souls. And this is, I don't know, I guess they would, the anthropologists would have some fancy um, um, term for it, whether you call it cultural memory or retention or whatever, but they don't say, we don't say, I come to get my costume, I come to get me. And I, for me, even talking about it, I get goosebumps. That is, I found that to be profound, you know? And so there's that deeper level of Junkanoo beyond the career and the competition, when we listen to our hearts and when we listen to our souls, we know deep, 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 deep down that we are not doing this only to win a parade. That's important too, but this is, that's not the only reason that we are doing it. And I, I feel personally that the reason that we do it is for freedom, freedom of mind, yes. freedom of body, freedom of our oh, soul. Boy. 
to celebrate Glory. from where we come from. And that's why people say, you're so passionate and crazy about junk and the You know, that was passed down through my bloodline, literally. On both yeah. my sides, my dad and my mom's side. You know, I told the story on your show of how that was passed down. And that's why my passion for it is so lit. And I like mm -hmm. a lot of persons to understand why I'm, I'm, I'm like this and what my ancestors went through for me Amen. to be able to celebrate Amen. it. And not just oh with tribalism, not mm. just with uh, you got this costume. People were shackled, chained, suffered mm. for you to mm. be able to come up. They sweet mm. and ring a cowbell and beat a drum. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wait, let me let me let me ask you a quick question, both ladies. Mm -hmm. Which which type of parade or what parade is the most spiritual and and, and, and the music is, is is just really uplift your, your your spirit and your soul? I I, I guess, me? But, but, yeah. Yeah, which parade? Alan, you want to go first? No, 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 I because I don't know. <laughs> but let me tell you, let me tell you, I let me tell you which parade you mean from on um, Bay Street? In because general, all, 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 all. I will, I, I got two, I got two. The first one is Boxing Day because it, it is like it takes it's so much months before you, you get hype up. You have so many little small ones to hype you up to get yes. the big one. And yes. that's what it makes me excited is going there by Pompeii Museum downtown where they say the slaves were held. You Amen. have a different feeling. Feeling. Oh, right my. on that block right there to know that oh. they, they were peeping through the bars there. Oh my. You understand? And so every time that I walk through that corner, I just get goosebumps. Goosebumps. Because I just look Amen. at that building and remember the story. Listen, this is where my people come from. This is where my people Amen. shackled and chained Amen. for me to be Amen. able to come Amen. and rush down Bay Street. And the Amen. second festival I get excited about is Fox Hill Emancipation uh -huh. Day because it brings me back to the yes. emancipation aspect of it. Why we yes. rushing here for freedom yes. again? So it's, that's almost, it's, it's, it's almost like Fox Hill is the perfect venue for jumping. Yeah. Almost yeah. perfect, perfect. perfect. Yeah. There's no feeling like that. That when you go around that circle in the heart of Fox Hill, let me tell you, that's a powerful experience. Yes, that's an experience. Mm -hmm. And and and, yeah. and you won't believe it. Every like like Papa and I spoke about when you take pictures of people or you filming people, you mm -hmm. can see different spirits on them. They don't see it themselves until they watch themselves or they see themselves in a different picture to see what the different spirits that are on them. Yes, yes. And the other, the, as you talk about that, the other thing that always touches me is Junkanoo at a funeral. Oh, yes. I could remember that, one. That, that's the one. That's the yes. one. Yes. I, yeah. was, I could remember one time yes. there was a funeral. I don't know if it was Boy or who it was, but there was a funeral that we came down, um, we came down um, uh, Cumberland Street. Up, up, mm -hmm. It was coming from St. Mm -hmm. Agnes. And we mm -hmm. came down Cumberland and we went around the beach and oh, that was the road, yeah. yeah the road was full of people and I was standing I was trying to take a picture from standing up on where Junkano Beach is on that little ledge and there was a visitor who came up on the side of me and she said what is it it's a parade and I said ma'am it's a funeral <laughs> <laughs> she, <laughs> she said what I said, yes, ma'am. This is how we celebrate our, our funerals in the Bahamas. It's a celebration. And she was so impressed. But that, I mean, more than anything, drove home to me that we are really a unique people. You know what I mean? And I was, I was just so proud to be able to share that with somebody who did not understand um, the tradition. You know, that every rite of passage in our life, and that includes when we go from from now to eternity, we commemorate it in our own unique way. And that's very, that's very special to me. And see, the thing about it is, Alan, uh, a lot of people don't understand of John Canoe, um, the different materials and stuff that we used back in the day. Mm -hmm. You understand mm -hmm. the newspaper, the garbage, you know, yeah. any John Canoe. leaf. It was not anything that anything. I came to you to be able to use it for you to celebrate your freedom. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Anything that came to you. And, you, and Boya was one Boya. of those. Boya. Boya, Boya, Boya was, was one of them. the epitome of Junkanoo. Boy, yeah. I was so, you just look at him. That was a spirit he had in him. That, that was us right there. That was definitely us. And the thing about it is we have one or two other persons too 
that tender, yes. you know, when you, when you see that spectrum <clears throat> on them, and even in about uh, having all, all the feathers, all the bees, or it's that spirit. Right, it's that the spirit. spirit that takes over. And so we Absolutely. have to let now um, uh, our minds, let, not, let, let our minds not get taken over by all of this yeah. dress and glamour. We still yes. got to get back yes. to the basics. My father, right, okay, back to the core. got to get back to basics. Back to the core. That's the same COVID 19 period here. It's a period mm -hmm. of us to take charge and get back to going to basic because that's where we're going to have to start back from if we want John Kunu back. Yes. We're going to have to start back from. That's here. right. And, 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 and as you say that, you are absolutely right. And, and this, this, is only, this is only tangentially connected. But I just want to say very, very quickly um, that we need to preserve those things that are unique to us. Jankunu, um in Carnival was brought to our part of the world by Roman Catholic countries. In Roman Catholic countries, the big celebration is always before Lent, which is the 40 days of fasting to prepare for the great feast of Easter. And so you go crazy the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday when Lent begins. The French call it Mardi Gras, Fat Tuesday. The church calls it Shrove Tuesday. So you have, in some um, um, Roman Catholic countries, you have Mardi Gras, others call it Carnival. Farewell to flesh, carne and bow. You're giving up meat. And so you are, you, 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 and so you, you letting it all hang out because come Wednesday morning, you got to be in mass for Ash Wednesday. Mm -hmm. So, so Brazil, where the Portuguese settled, the French were in Louisiana. All of South America is Spanish. The French and Spanish were in, were in Trinidad and so on. In British territories, in the British tradition, the great festival of the church is Christmas. Mm -hmm. And so Christmas celebrations sprang up in, 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 in former British territories in North and South Carolina had John Kankus. Uh, Jamaica has John Canoe. Uh, Bermuda has the Gombes and so on. Only in the Bahamas has it survived and flourished into the magnificent spectacle that we have today. But the point I want to make is that John Canoe came across that Atlantic in chains with our ancestors buried in the hearts and souls of our ancestors. Carnival came from Europe and the Africans joined in, okay? This belongs to us. And I want us to understand very clearly that in this day and time, on the surface, superficially, they may appear to be similar. They are very different. And once we keep, once we keep our lines clear and we understand very clearly what the differences are, then to each his own. But we have, I think, a moral obligation to preserve Jankanu in gratitude for what our ancestors have done for us. I don't think we need to borrow nobody else festival when they gave us one of our own. That's my personal feeling, but I just want a lot of people to get mixed up between Shankanu and Carnival, and I just wanted to make that distinction. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a great, great evening. Mm -hmm. I, I had my, uh, I don't, I, how much time I didn't hear the story, Alan? I don't know, I can't even talk no more, but every time I hear the story, <laughs> It's like I'm just hearing it again for the first time. And I just wanted a lot of junk words to understand really the concept mm -hmm. of where we really came from. You know, Thank we you. apologize for the little technical difficulties that we have in and out. Because not only you were having um, problems on your end, I was having some problems on my end and main internet completely gone at some oh, point. And so that's why we had people, but it's a good thing that we recorded me. So we ain't yes. with that. We got that done. Not at all. Not at all. We got that Not at all. So I would just like to say thank you, Arlene, for, for you know, for 
enlightening our minds and lifting our spirits to really hear from when we came. I Amen. From when Amen. we came. Pastor, Amen. Papa, you have anything to say? Uh, no, that's a, it was a real educational uh, adventure tonight. And thank you very thank much. You. Uh, I really appreciate it. I learned a lot. And um, hopefully I'll be able to pass it on to as many people as possible. Well, well, great, great. Of course, we're definitely going to share it. And we'd like to say um, to all the Junkin' Woods listening, you know, I send out a little note today, Arlene, to let all Junkin' Woods who, who are the small businessmen to inbox me. You know, my aim is to help us to build revenue in this COVID-19 mm -hmm. time and to mm -hmm. help to advertise them on the pages. You see, they're being sponsored by a lot of persons yes. who trying to get that business out there. So that's Beautiful. what my initiative is to uplift them in their business time and help yes. support them with their business by some of the uh, who are Junkanu and whose costume is this and all this other thing. Different persons are calling me and I really, I'm trying to help them. So every day when you see that little tie go off, Charmaine post something, let's Junkanu, Charmaine post something. I'm just trying to keep that spirit going and keep yes. the fellow Junkanus inspired because yes. you know, it's hard for a lot of us. Not all of us can, you know, are on the same level and not all of us can just go there and put a penny to something. So it's good right. that I can show my support in that end of trying to support them. And you know, uh, yes. today I had a little um, um, call from some junk who and they were talking about the prices. Well, I say, you know what the price is? Uplifting our spirit. We are not here Amen. to belittle anybody. We are here to Amen. inspire, you know? Amen. And so tonight I have another four hours before I celebrate my 53rd birthday. <laughs> So I just uh, like happy birthday. It. Yes, I just happy like birthday. It. And I thank <laughs> God that I am literally here in oh yes, the, you know, the 2020 century yes. to celebrate yes. it. I've had my ups and downs, but I tell you, he has never left me. Never no up, forsaken me. Never. Never let me beg for bread. And I have my pastor mm -hmm. always tell me there's never a bill that God has not just paid for me. But he just pays it right on time. Amen. So folks, if you're listening in, we thank you. We want you to go ahead and share this video. And once again, we'd like to thank Miss Arlene Nash Ferguson. And you know, I, I, I always say, listen, when it comes to history, ain't nobody to tell that story like Arlene. And listen, I you see I open my mouth, right? <laughs> and you know that ain't you know that ain't me. I have something to say, but I ain't yeah. open my mouth. And, and I just like to say a shout out to my BFF and uh, all the way over there in the state. He was in New York in Fort Lauderdale and he said, show me out. So I was wow. to you and I told him, listen, tune in tonight, boy, because you got to hear the story. Thank you. Yes, yeah. yeah, we got yeah. to hear the story. So again, Alan, I thank you from, from my ancestors and your ancestors for all mm -hmm. of us just trying to keep this thing that we call Junkanoo alive. Amen. Alive. Thank you so much. I and, and let me again, I could never thank you both enough for what you do um, to document uh, John Canoe in our lifetime. Be blessed, be encouraged, and stay safe. And thank you again for Not a problem. Like we You're said, FIE John Canoe Rush, feel it in your belly. Everybody have a good evening. Be safe. Good night.